I'm Kimberly Parsons. I'm the house director at one of the Burlington business houses. Um, thanks for joining us for the speaker series, Women's Voices and the Criminal Justice System. Over the years, we've had several people who have served lengthy sentences because of the mandatory minimum guidelines set forth by Congress. More often than not, they arrive broken after spending most of their adult life in prison. Today, Cindy Shank will share her own story related to that. <coughs> Cindy is joining us today from Lansing, Michigan. She's the prize winning, uh, she's the subject of the prize winning HBO documentary, The Sentence, that was produced by her bro brother, Rudy Valdez. The documentary received national attention because it tells an important story. It's an important story for all of us to hear. We all know that criminal justice system isn't perfect, but Cindy knows in a brutally personal way because she and her family have directly suffered the consequences of it. What she has experienced has the ability to destroy people, but she was not defeated. Once she was released, she used her experience to fuel and energize her fight to seek the changes needed so that others would not have to suffer the same injustice. Thank you so much, Cindy. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate um, everybody coming and um, taking the time to hear my story. Um, as you touched on, I was incarcerated. Um, I guess we'll just start from the beginning. My name is Cindy Shank, and I'm an advocate for criminal justice reform. Um, in 2000, when I was 24 years old, I started dating a guy um, and we dated over the course of five years. And in that course, uh, he actually started selling drugs and became a quite a large drug dealer in the course of our five year relationship. He was murdered in 2002. Are you still standing? Oh yeah. I hear an audio. I don't know. The mic's on. Okay, sorry. Um, and uh, over the course of the five years, um, like I said, he grew into a large drug dealer. He was murdered in 2002. I was initially indicted in 2002 um, for his conspiracy um, for living in the house with him. I was actually released and my case was dismissed. They ended up arresting like 21 of his co-conspirators and you know they all went to trial and I just assumed they figured out what happened. You know, While I never sold drugs, used drugs or had anything to do with this drug business. I did know what he was doing and I did live in the home with him. Um, well, um, my case was dismissed. I moved on with my life. I got married and I had three daughters. Um, and after about six and a half years, the federal government came back, knocked on my door and charged me with all the crimes that were committed in the home that I lived in. And I was sentenced to 15 years in federal prison. When I went away, my daughter Autumn was four years old Ava was two and Annalise was just six weeks old. Over the course of the next nine years, I spent in federal prison just being, you know, doing everything I could to stay connected with my daughters. I was in initially in Lexington, or I was sorry, I was initially in Pekin, Illinois, which was about seven hours away. And I was able to see my daughters about every five to six weeks. The prison then closed for women and was, was transferred over to a men's our debt facility and I was moved to Florida. At that time, I only saw my daughters in those three years uh, twice. And that was absolutely devastating to me and my daughters. I then put in for, was able to get a transfer and was able to move to Lexington, Kentucky where I was only about five hours away from them. So I was able to start getting regular visits from them again, which was awesome. After about eight or nine years, to be honest with you, it, the weight of, the sentence was becoming unbearable. You think that, you know, early, you know, the longer you do, the easier it'll get or anything like that. That was not the case. The longer you do, the heavier it weighs on you. And it was becoming such an unbearable weight that I could no longer stand it anymore. I was in such a bad place. It was just so, it was so devastating at that time. And by the grace of God and just, I think he knew, you know, where I was at in my life that I couldn't take it anymore. I was actually given clemency from President Obama in 2016 after serving nine years and I was able to come home 
in 2016 and reunite with my daughters. Autumn at that time was 13, Ava was 11, and Annalise was nine. And I spent her entire life incarcerated. That's what started my advocacy work. That's what started me being able to, you know, have the opportunity to speak with people and just share my experiences of what happened. What I wanted more than anything while I was incarcerated was somebody to hear me, somebody to know what I was going through. I was screaming from the inside behind those walls and it was felt like nobody was listening. And the one thing about being incarcerated is you don't have that communication with the outside world. You don't have the internet. You don't have these things to know what's going on, to know, you know what's happening out there, that there are people fighting for you. So when I was given the opportunity to speak, you know, when it first started, when I first came home, I was like, I was nervous, I was scared, but I was like, how can I not, how can I not share my story when all I wanted was for somebody to hear me? So I figured I could be a voice for those who are still left behind. Um, as you touched on, there was a documentary um, when the, how and that has given me a, a great platform. Um, how that started was when I was first incarcerated, my brother, who was actually a school teacher at the wow. time, came to visit me about a year and a half in and he was like, um, I wanna tell your story. And I was like, "What? you know, sure. He's like, I wanna film the girls. I want to be able to share, you know, what's happening. And I was like, yeah, not thinking anything about it. Just he's a school teacher, he's gonna film my girls. I was like, yeah, absolutely. So what ended up happening is over those nine years, he would film my daughters. He would film birthdays, recitals, you know, any, any event that I was missing in hopes that one day I would be able to see these things. And when I was released, he actually, the film was picked up by Sundance. Um, we actually won Sundance Film Festival, um, the Audience Choice Award, HBO picked it up and that just given, given us a very large platform. And ever since then, we've been able to really utilize that and speak to um, quite a few different audiences. We've been able to, I've been able and been fortunate enough to speak you know, in Washington on a couple of different occasions, lobby certain bills to help you know, people with incarceration. And I've been able to use my voice so that is like something that's very powerful and very, I'm very proud of. But what sticks with me more than anything is my day to day. My daughters, while, you know, they're so happy that I'm home, I'm so happy that I'm home. It is still taking a toll on our family. You know, those nine years that I was gone, I can't get that back. They can't get that back. That is gone. Um, I do try and focus on where we are now. And, and I live every day thinking about that. People ask me often, you know, how are the girls and, and how has this affected them? And honestly, I don't think we'll truly know how these almost a decade of them being away from me and me, my incarceration will affect them probably for years to come. It shapes the way they think. It shapes the choices that they make. It shapes, you know, who they are, you know. And one thing that I am is I'm always honest about everything that I'm going through because I owe my children and I owe those who are incarcerated to be honest. My kids are in, are in therapy. Um, I'm in therapy. Um, it's, been a, it's been a struggle. You know, my oldest was their mom since she was four years old and she's taken on that role. And, and even now, you know, it, it has eased a little bit, you know, she, you know, I'm mom, but she still carries that burden of being mom. You know, she's only 18 years old but she was mom since she was four, you know, so she, she sees that, that, that relationship. And I respect that, you know, I don't overbear. I don't try and say, well, I'm the mom, you know, I let them be comfortable in where we all are in our positions, you know, right now is just being family. My middle daughter, Ava, she has been in and out of mental health for the last two years. Um, she's, you know, suffers from anxiety, depression, you know, self-harm, and, and we're working through that. You know, I'm fortunate enough and thankful that I'm home for this, in a home to be there for her, you know, as much as I can, you know, on call 24 hours when she's with her dad, and she tends to be with me quite often now, but I think that it stems from, you know, the abandonment and all the things that she went through as a, you know, as a child without me, and, and Annalise, we've built our relationship since I've been home, she, you know, five years, but she didn't know me before that. She knew I was her mom. She knew about me being, you know, she'd come to visit me and she knew I was her mom, but that bond has only been built in the last five years. So it's, it's a day to day. It's, it's an everyday. And we're going to struggle for this with this for the next, you know, 
forever. I think it's always going to be part of us. I don't think we ever step away from incarceration or the effects of it. I just think you learn to deal with it and you learn to move on and just be the best person you can be. You know, I'm just trying to be the best mom that I can be, you know, every single day by being there for them and, and listening to them. And, you know, when they're mad, cause you know, they'll bring it up. Well, you were gone and you're right. I was gone. And, you know, I'm sorry for that, but you know, I just have to love them every day and, and just do everything that I can. So that's, you know, that's where I am. And that's what brings me today. You know, I, I'm fortunate enough to be able to share my story. I'm fortunate enough to be able to say that I have my kids, you know, and I have my parents and I'm able to spend time with them, but there's so many people who don't get that opportunity. And I just know how fortunate I am. So I definitely want to share that every day if I can. <laughs> Is there any questions or do you guys, I just seem like I'm just talking about myself. <laughs> It seems a little... Hi, Cindy, this is Kristen. Um, I think I got right in a few minutes after you started, so I think I missed the first part of your story, and I apologize, um, but I don't know if you were able to uh, speak a little bit to um, kind of what would have been helpful for you, either um, before you were incarcerated, you know, that might have, like, if, if you view there to be social supports that you didn't have, um, around, you know, around needs that were unmet or, you know, kind of implications for us. I think there's a lot of service providers here working on, you know, trying to lessen the people going in. And so I'd love to hear your perspective on what you think might've been helpful for you um, that we can work toward. Absolutely. Um, well, being that I had never been in, in any kind of trouble, I'd never even had a speeding ticket. I was very unaware of the process. Um, I didn't know what to expect. I, I, you know, it just having any kind of tools or even just somebody to say, this is what's going to happen, or this is the process of what happens when you're, you know, pre-trial or anything that's going on beforehand. I learned everything as it happened. You know, even my attorney, gosh, you, you just think that <laughs> you pay somebody, you know, your last dime and hope that they're on your side, but you know, who really ever is. I just think that information about what the process is about incarceration or even beforehand what things you need to do you know I did the best I could I did um I did schedule for my daughters to start therapy literally the week I left they started play therapy um so I was just doing everything in my mind to that I knew to do to help my kids because I knew that you know once I went away it was going to be devastating for them so my real focus was not so much myself you know it was more like what's going to happen to my to my kids and to my family so even having resources for family members because that that's truly who's affected by it. I mean I'm you can't help me I'm behind bars I'm you know what I'm saying I'm locked away I, there's no access to me but you could definitely help me by knowing that my family is okay. You know, you don't understand how many times that I had to hear women on the phone crying and devastating because their children got taken away or they were staying at this person's house and were it wasn't a safe environment because they were, you know, molested by the person that was there. Another woman's child was murdered because they were in somebody else's care who didn't care for them. It's just the, the, the stakes are so high when you're a mother who's away from your children because mo mothers are the ones who protect, nurture, and care. You know, I, I do believe fathers are capable of that as well, but as we all know as women, we're the primary caretakers of our children. And I think that's, you know, I, I was fortunate enough that they were with their dad, so I knew they were safe. But as far as, you know, normally kids are just left kind of to fend for themselves, either in the system or, you know, with the random relative, and then they're just not being cared for properly. I think that's, you know, something that eased me while I was incarcerated, knowing that my children were safe. Thanks for sharing that, Cindy. So let's start asking Cindy questions. We already have some great questions that have come up in the chat. You can ask questions two different ways. Either you can raise your hand and we'll call on you, or you can use the chat box. So the next question that has come up is Suba would like to thank you for sharing your story. And she said, it sounds like your marriage did not survive your time in prison. Can you share how that affected you and your children? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, their Adam, their father is a wonderful man. He's, he's a, he's a great father. He was an awesome husband. Um, but, you know, he was doing his time with me and when, you know, he did four years, as I call it, of being incarcerated with me, married to me. And when he came to the decision and it wasn't an easy decision to have, get divorced, I totally understood. I, you know, he had met someone and he wanted to move on with his life. And honestly, it devastated me, you know, but I had to think outside of me, you know, I had to think about my kids and I was not there. So how could I not allow him to have his life? You know what I mean? Like he was going to have a woman there and, and a mother figure for them. And who would not want more love for their children? So that's what I thought. I was thinking, well, I can't be there, but somebody else can. And you have to love them enough to let them go and to live their life. And that's what he was doing. And we're great friends now, you know, we're, you know, we co-parent and he's an awesome person. And I just totally understood, you know, he was there with me and God, if he could get released from that sentence, of course, run, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was devastating, it was hard on him. So I was glad he was able to, to find someone and, and be happy. Thank you, Cindy. And, and Christina, I, I think we all agree. She said that you are incredibly brave and we really appreciate you being here and being vulnerable and sharing your story. Maria asked the question, what was the law that was broken and what state were you in? Yeah, I was in the state of Michigan and um, I was charged with everything that Alex had done while he was living in the home. So by the letter of the law, I was, my actual sentence was, I was charged with possession with intent to distribute cocaine, marijuana, and crack, along with conspiracy to all the crimes that happened related to Alex, along with the, I received a two point gun enhancement. So basically living in the home and knowing what he was doing, I was subsequently responsible. That's what they call the girlfriend problem, <laughs> which is, you know, a big problem. I was, I'm not alone though. You would think I, you know, when I first went in, I thought, oh my gosh, they made a mistake. They didn't really understand. And then I get there and I start meeting all these women who are there exactly like me. That's very common. So Cindy, I have a question that's something that has come up in some other speaker series we've had. How have your freedoms changed? since being released as far as voting, getting a driver's license, th things of that nature. How is that different for you? Um, initially, when I first came home, it was a little bit um, challenging because I was incarcerated for so long. I actually had to go down to the to our local courthouse and, and prove that I was alive. They had me as nothing. Like I had zero as a person. I had to bring bring my like you know, birth certificate, social security card, and any kind of ID or piece of mail that I had to prove that I was somebody, you know, a still a valid person because they didn't have me in any kind of system whatsoever because I'd been gone for so long. Once I established that, it wasn't too difficult for me. I do have, did and still do have a very strong support system and a very strong family. Um, I was able to, um, you know, get my license. I, in the state of Michigan, you can vote. So I was able to vote there wasn't a hindrance there and I did vote of course um but there are certain things that are they're very very much barriers for people when I first came out I was um I had to check in in Battle Creek so for me that's a two and a half hour drive one way so part of my you know when I got out I would have to check with my probation officer and they were in Battle Creek and I would have to do you know mental health checks I would have to do just daily they said to come, I would have to come, you know? So I did all these things, but yet they wanted you to keep a job and they, you know, that was part of your requirement or you break probation. But yet here I am with a new job, 21 days out, I did get hired in, in a company, but they're requiring me three or four times a week to leave between eight and five. I'm like, that was very challenging. Now I did ask my probation officer, I said, you know, Fortunately, I have a vehicle, but what would I do if I didn't? He said, well, you take the bus. 
So I would supposed to take the bus during work hours. They just make it very challenging. And you, they set you up for failure. And that's one of the things that, you know, it's, it's very hard to understand as, as somebody who's trying to, to move forward and thinking that these people are supposed to help you that they don't, they set things up, they set, the, set things to make it very difficult for you to succeed. And that's what's, you know, I guess it's called job security on their end, but it's a double standard when they're supposed to be the ones to help you. Thanks, Cindy. So let's go to Kim who has her hand up. Yes, um, thank you again so much, Cindy. Um, you know, when, when I was reading, you know, researching you, we had you as a guest speaker in 2019. I was really struck by, um, you know, your family, how much, you know, your mother did daycare, your former husband, your brother, your parents, um, you know, your father selling scrap metal to send money to you while you were in jail so you could make the calls to your kids. Um, you know, I, I sense that it was really difficult for them, but somehow they were there for you. Um, what do you think, where would you be if you didn't have them? So a lot of the women who you, you know, talk about leaving behind who maybe have public defenders um, don't have that family support. Do you think you would be here today? Um, if, if you could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. It's hard for me to kind of think like, you know, what if, um, just because I, you know, I have my mother and father's blood in me and I have their tenacity and their strength within me. And it's a testament to them and how they raised me for sure. But I can, you know, I could definitely tell you that I know women who didn't have similar support to me as I did. And, you know, a lot of them have gone back to prison. A lot of them, you know, um, I, I connect, I stay connected with a lot of women who like through Facebook and social media and things, you know, a lot of people have passed away, have, you know, suffered with drug addictions and didn't have that support or just didn't get the help that they needed. And, and, you know, women going back or just permanently losing their children. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen because of incarceration. Um, as far as for me, I, I just have to think that I would, you know, if I didn't have my parents, if something happened that I had lost them, that I, I still have that, I want to say, you know, that strength that they've always instilled in me that I've seen them in them growing up, you know, struggling. They're migrant workers. My parents were, um, you know, they've always been in the United States. They're not from Mexico or anything, but they grew up in Texas. They are, you know, Mexican American, but they were definitely migrant workers working hard. You know, my father, with a third grade education, he opened up his own business, successful grocery store and, and restaurant. My mother, when they settled in Lansing, Michigan, she uh, she went back to school and she she um, retired school teacher of 27 years. I mean, my she was police commissioner of our city for eight years. My mother, they're very involved in you know they they just have they're really strong people, and that's definitely where I get it from <laughs> is from them. And even like for me, when I got out, I did get a job 21 days out um, and I'm still with the same company. I've been promoted nine times now. I am doing well. I'm in a seat that, I, you know, I'm comfortable in and, and I'm just thankful to have that drive and that, you know, I bought my own home. Um, I was able to do all these things. I wanted more than anything to give my kids, you know, that structure, that security, that place that they can come with me and say, this is our house. So. That's what I did. I set my mind to it and I sure did it. <laughs> and do you think without sort of your, I know that your brother worked with your attorney um, that, that you would have gotten out without kind of having that advocate? Absolutely not. I, I don't think that I would have gotten clemency hadn't been for my brother. Um, it, it's funny, you know, because he was such, he was so instrumental in being there, my support and my strength, even when I was really losing strength in there because of being there for so long that he never, he never gave up hope. He never wavered. Even if he did, he didn't share that with me. He kept strong for me. And that was so important. Um, he would, and this was before now he's, you know, he's quite successful and he's, you know, has things on Netflix and HBO and all these things. He's doing wonderful. And I'm such a blessing and testament to him, but 
you know, this guy was just a school teacher when he started out just making a film with a camera on his back, filming my girls and, you know, made a name for himself. But he, everywhere he would go, if he would hear of a conference, he'd go where he, you know, on his last dime, he'd go and he'd share my story, you know, and he said he would use the, uh, the political playbook. He said he would always say my name. Anybody he would speak, he'd say Cynthia Shanks, Cynthia Shanks, Cynthia Shanks, that in hopes that one day when we did apply for clemency, that that would go across somebody's desk and they'd remember my name, Cynthia Shank. And mm -hmm. I think that was a testament to him and how hard he fought for me and just how much of an advocate he was. And he dedicated his entire life, almost a decade to, to me and my daughters. And You can't thank a person enough for that, you know, but it shouldn't take that. That's why we continue to do the work that we do and try and get these laws changed because it shouldn't take a person to dedicate their entire life to get justice. It shouldn't take that, you know, it should be, you know, the rules should change and, and judges should see, you know, you should deviate from sentencing mandatory minimum laws is, is what's killing you know killing us and what's filling up these prisons and those things need to be changed and that's what we're continuing continuing to fight for so cindy this actually brings up a really interesting question from elizabeth who would like to know would the charge have been different if you were married rather than being the girlfriend i'm not sure i've never really mm -hmm. um I don't think so, only because I've met other women who were married in the same situation and who given the same. I think there would have been different if he hadn't been deceased, if the person, my boyfriend at the time, if he hadn't been murdered and he would have been alive, I think he would have gotten the charges and then I would have gotten just the conspiracy. Um, but because he was deceased, they had nobody to charge that everything too, the drugs they found and you know the whole everything too but so they only had me so that's why I was charged with everything as far as my understanding and how everything worked okay. and then we have another question of uh, where the drugs trafficked and is that why it was federal federal charges yeah it was from yeah he had owned a trucking company and was mm -hmm. moving drugs over the state lines yeah mm -hmm. So uh, another question about what we were just talking about, what you mentioned about really needing to change these laws is were there other groups or people who rallied to support you and worked to free you? And then have you seen any change in the law as a result of your advocacy? Absolutely. Um, there, were, there, there are many groups. I was uh, uh, Amy Pova, Can Do Foundation. She was very instrumental in having me on her list of top 10 women uh, deserving clemency and she would advocate for me in Washington. Um, there were uh, a lot of groups that, you know, just advocating in general for women of incarceration, um, but definitely Amy Pova and her Can Do Cop Foundation de definitely played an instrumental role. Along with the Obama clemency, um, the attorneys that all volunteered, they were, my attorney that actually was my clemency attorney, she was a, um, she was a, I don't want to get it wrong. She was, um, I want to say like a tax attorney. She, her job wasn't criminal justice at all. She was a tax attorney, but she volunteered. Obama asked for, you know, volunteers, lawyers to come in and help process all these paperwork. And she just happened to get my case. And she reached out to my brother and reached out to me and I actually spoke with her on the phone um, while she was getting the petition ready and she was just amazing and she was a mother like me of three boys I had three girls we, she just we related very well and she really fought for me and she submitted my clemency work and petition and and I think that's you know played a big part she was a she volunteered so how could you you know she definitely changed my life. Cindy, it sounds like you've had the fortune to be surrounded by a lot of really caring, lovely, amazing people that, that wanted to help you. So another interesting question from Carolyn, if the charge had been conspiracy without the other charges, do you know what the typical sentence may have been? Yeah, it would have been um, mandatory minimum for the amount of drugs. It would have been 10 years. 
and that's what I guess that touched on the other kind of question I forgot to answer. Mandatory minimum law is what played a crucial role in my sentencing. The prosecutor actually asked for 96 years for me. That was his recommendation of how much time that he thought I should do. The judge um, who sat through the trial went as low as he possibly could go. And at sentencing, he said, you know, I'm giving you 15 years, but um, which is because I'm bound by mandatory minimum law. He didn't want to give me that. He even said it right there in front of everyone and was like, please come before me again if you can, because he would lessen my sentence if he could legally, but by because of the mandatory minimum laws that uh, he could not. Um, so that is one thing that has changed uh, in the last couple of years is the mandatory minimum. You can now deviate from the mandatory, mi mandatory minimum. It's not um, something that I think that judges do because they tend to still stick with precedents, but more and more judges are do have that opportunity now, um, which is to deviate from sentencing. A lot of great comments coming up. Uh, Christina, yeah, uh, I agree. Mandatory minimum sentencing is terrible. And, and Sadie says, this is why I refuse to call the system anything but the criminal legal system. It's not justice. Excellent comment, Sadie. So we have a couple of other questions and I'm going to go to Karen's next and we will get to yours, Christina. Karen would like to know what can ordinary citizens do to help put an end to these injustices that are happening in the first place besides helping to gain release or clemency for incarcerated women? How, how can we help? What can we do? One thing I always say first and foremost is absolutely know who you're voting for and what it is they stand for. And I don't just mean the presidency. I mean, all the way back down to, you know, your, your school boards. I mean, you have to know who it is that you're voting for in these positions, because these are the people that are making the decisions for you. Um, that's like the bare minimum, just being informed on who you're voting for. I absolutely always recommend to Google your own area. Um, there's people doing work in every city, in every state across this country, um, grassroots, whether it's just, you know, writing letters to people of incarceration. We do, you know, I get involved with a couple different groups every year and we write cards for people who are incarcerated. Um, but there's just, you know, like where I'm at, I got involved locally, um, and working with a, late, uh, a wonderful woman and just trying to help where I am. I do speak all over the country and, and I do enjoy that, but I figured what, what, could, what could I be doing more locally? And those are the things that I encourage other people to do is just see who's doing the work in your town, in your area, and just volunteer. What can I do? Ask, ask what's required, whether it's you know making phone calls, whether it's writing letters, whether it's just you know, helping out at uh, organization or showing up for a run, donating, you just never know what is needed in your area. Thank you for those excellent ideas, Cindy. And then uh, Christine would like to know the foundations and organizations that assisted you, if you either could name them or if you could also provide us with a list, that's something that we can share. As well. Yeah, absolutely. I can provide you with a list. There's so many women, so many different organizations. The one I definitely go to first, like I said, was Amy's Can Do Foundation. There's also the Columbia University of Criminal Justice, um, which is doing excellent work all over all over the country. Um, there's Free Her, the Free Her um, Foundation, which is also doing really excellent work. I Andrea James is an advocate. That's somebody that is so powerful that I just love. Um, there's just so many, honestly, <laughs> and I didn't learn about these until after I got out. And that's one of the things that, you know, we do try in different organizations, try and get materials on the inside because we don't know when you're incarcerated, you do not know what's going on on the outside. You just don't, unless you have somebody like my brother who was able to like tell me things little by little, but even then 15 minute phone calls are very limited and emails are very limited. Um, but just sharing information with people who are incarcerated gives beads of hope. And the one thing that I always like to say is when you are incarcerated, hope is the hardest thing to have, but it's the one thing that you can't live without. And that's what I think what we're doing, what you guys are doing is offering hope. Thank you. So Mandy has a, a question. We'll ask you to be a little vulnerable to answer this one, Cindy. 
do you think you should have been charged or sentenced at all? Um, yeah, I definitely knew what he was doing. Um, what I don't really talk a whole lot about is my actual situation, why I was still with this man. Um, I was, like I said, I was 24 years old when I met him. He was a wonderful guy. He was young. We were, fell in love, that whole scene. He changed. He started selling drugs early on and he just changed the person that he was. Over the next five years, I actually became, he cut me away from my family. He was very abusive and very manipulative and had kind of this control over me. And at that time, I couldn't see the door out. I didn't understand that I had a choice to actually leave. But I know now that I did. So do I deserve time? Absolutely. What that time would have been, I don't know. I did know what he was doing. I didn't go to the police. So by the letter of the law, I was guilty. So, you know, obviously, I think if somebody is guilty of a crime, they need to be punished. But, you know, let the punishment fit the crime. I don't think it should have changed the course of my entire life. I don't think it should have changed my entire, my children's lives, um, my family's lives. I think, you know, that could have been better. There could have been a better way maybe a couple of years probation, I would have gladly paid, you know, a fine, you know, however amount of money. Um, but that's what happened and I just have to live with it. So because of the emotional abuse that you suffered, because you, you were cut off from everyone, you felt like you didn't have any other choice but to stay with him, even though you knew what he was doing. Yeah. But I still knew I was still an adult. I still, I still could, you know, I have to pay my play my own devil's advocate. You know, I could still say, you know, pity me. And, but I still had my, you know, I, I could have left whether he would have, you know, killed me or which, what he would, what he threatened all the time, or, you know, I don't know, but in hindsight, I didn't leave because I was scared. And that was just the decision that I made. And I had to suffer the consequences of it. And uh, Christina says in the chat, I disagree that you should have been charged. It sounds like you would have been a good candidate for a restorative process. I agree. <laughs> but, you know, I have to, you know, I just have to like respect, even though it's very hard to, I, I have to understand that, you know, there are built laws in place and, and I could have actually, yeah, I mean, I agree, you know, I could have done a lot of other things. I could have done community service for five years. You're done, you know, but I didn't have that say. Um, if I think another person should be charged for the same thing, knowing what I went through, I would say no, you know, but that's why I got to be a judge so I can make those decisions, I guess. And Sadie brings up a really great point about the intersection of domestic violence and involvement in the system. So Cindy, when you were incarcerated, is this something that you saw other women had also been a victim of domestic violence, whether it was emotional, physical, mental abuse and being yeah. involved in the system? Absolutely. I think a lot of the women there actually, I mean, I can't say all, but a lot of the women there were in the exact same situation that I was in, or they, they, their circumstances like there were, I was impressed with a lot of women who were addicted to drugs um and I think they would have been better served in a facility uh opposed to being incarcerated maybe you know a, a rehab facility and did they do a crime yes but they were sick they had you know there's a difference and I didn't know that was my naive I didn't know about be people who use drugs and did those things I actually never been around people who actually use like I never even knew what meth was, to be honest with you, until I got incarcerated. I knew heard I knew about heroin and things like that, but I had never been around people until I met them and I stood understood and listened to their stories and they, you know, that is a sickness, it is an illness, and they were better, they would have been better off served, you know, not spending 10, 15, 30 years incarcerated. So there's it's it's definitely, I think incarceration is used as a just kind of like a, you know throw them away, you know, instead of addressing different individual problems, it's just kind of like, it's called being buried alive is what we called it on the inside. That's what it felt like. Um, you're just forgotten. And it's kind of like a problem not solved and you just push it away and hope it goes away. Thanks, Cindy. 
So any, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat box. If someone has a question, if you want to raise your hand or unmute. And I do have another question that I'll ask Cindy while I'm waiting for people to do that. So Cindy, do you think if we are able to work towards stopping the cycle of abuse that we see so many women suffering from, that we would be able to stop women from being incarcerated if in some places, if we do see this intersection, as Sadie pointed out, of domestic violence and involvement in the system. I think it plays a really big part. I think um, it, maybe not because I don't know, you would have to stop the abuser, but I think having um, more, I guess, attention to, I, I guess it stems down to like financial, a lot of it, you know, women stay because they need to be able to take care of their children or they stay because they don't feel safe. So whether it's education, whether it's providing people the tools to be able to do things on their own, I think that plays a big part. Um, I think women stay a lot of the time because they don't feel that they can do it alone or, you know, so I think they put up with it to a lot of times for children. Um, a lot of it is the physical abuse. How do you stop a physical abuser from being physically abusive? You know, um, women have, I know there's a lot of facilities out there and, and there are, you know, more and more people and organizations helping people who are coming from domestic violence, but it's a very, it's a very hard thing to share. It's a very hard thing to express. It's, it's hard to, you know, my parents, my family didn't even know that I was going through the things that I was going through. Um, they knew, you know, they were going through their own things at that time. So my family was kind of spaced out at the time. My parents were getting a divorce. My brother was living in New York. Like we were kind of a little separated at that time. And I had already been kind of being alienated from my family. Um, but they didn't know the extent of what I was going through because it's embarrassing. You don't want to say, you know, so there's that stigma attached to that as well. Right. So there's a lot of things that I think that can be done in when it comes to abuse and mm -hmm. mental, physical, and how that affects people. But I think of, you know, helping women, um, you know, giving them the opportunities to, you know, education and jobs and things like that. I think it plays a big part. Thank you. And Sadie, thank you for being vulnerable and sharing in the chat that she's a formerly incarcerated survivor. And she shared that 90% of the women are abuse survivors, according to the most recent research, and that's an undercount. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Kim, I see that your hand is up. Yeah, um, again, I noticed something, um, Cindy, I, I think you talked about this, but it might have been Rudy. Um, and I think it's really important because those of us um, who are, you know, a part of of this, uh, maybe think a lot about the human cost. Um, I think your brother called it the heart cost, you know, and how that ripples through, you know, the family, your kids, your parents, you know, it just changes lives forever. Um, but he also talked about the financial cost. And I know, you know, we've um, had people live at Dismas House who have done 20 years for not being a drug kingpin, but having similar charges to yours, federal time. And, um, you know, we used to call that the million dollar education because, you know, the estimate was that that was about a million dollars, except had people get out, um, you know, who couldn't use technology, you know, didn't have it. They basically grew up in prison. You know, they were just, um, you know, kind of stunted for life. You know, I just, um, and I think that's really valuable when we're talking about it because, you know, sometimes our audience is similar, you know, those of us who maybe are thinking about the human cost, but then, you know, there's this financial cost that could be, you know, those, that funding could be put to better use, like you said, you know, treatment or, um, you know, there's nothing kind of more expensive than jail. So why aren't we looking at alternatives? You know, we've created this, this machine um, and it's easier to keep fueling it than to rebuild. And I think that's really, you know, one of our challenges in the U.S. I agree. I think that's like, that is part of the system that is part of the machine and i mean it's job security for you know all of them you know from judges to prosecutors to lawyers to you know people who own these private prisons i mean this we can go down a rabbit hole with this one you know it's what are you talking about follow the money that's 
you know, there's a whole prison to pipe, you know, school to prison pipeline that, you know, is really talked about, about how, you know, you can tell by a person by third grade, uh, there was a study done. Um, you'll know by the third grade, whether that person's going to be bound for prison or whether they're bound for, um, college it's it's just it's really sick and it's really sad that it's set up that way but that's you know that's why we continue to do the work that we're doing and trying single you know independently doing everything that we can you know one thing every day if we can whether it's just sharing or having a conversation or looking up something or learning something um to change that questions coming up in the chat. Rita would like to know geographically, how do you make extended family work with you in Michigan, Rudy in New York, and your parents in Texas? Well, my parents are here in Lansing. Um, so I, I'm here. So my mom and dad, I'm where my mom and dad are at, um, for sure. I'm not going to go far. I spend too much time with my mom and dad. Um, Rudy, definitely in New York. Uh, it's been hard. He with COVID the last two years to really touch base with them. He's, I just seen him a couple of weeks ago. You know, we, we Zoom, we call each other, we have these conversations, but it's definitely been difficult in the last two years. He's actually had, uh, he had another baby and I've only seen her once from afar. It's just, it's very difficult, but as we all know, you know, how times are at this time being difficult to spend that time with family, but He's still working, definitely doing work. I'm still working. We're always having conversations. Um, we're just doing it the best we can, like via Zoom and just trying to make the best of it at this time. Thanks, Cindy. Mandy has a fantastic question. As the mother of three daughters, what advice would you give to them and to young women in general? Advice when it comes to what? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things I would like to share. Um, I guess, you know, one of the things that I talk to my kids about more than anything is just, um, we talk a lot about being where we are, loving each other where we are. Um, they'll bring up things in the past and, and they'll cry and they'll get upset. And, you know, I have to remind them that I'm here now and, and we just have to learn to cherish each other every day. You know, we can really get bogged down with what, what ifs and what could have been, but I think, you know, the kids are resilient and I think they're strong. And I think if we're there for them every day and we just try every single day to do something better, be better and just be with them. Like I, I just focus every day on like, you know, my first thought is always like, where are my girls? What are my girls doing? What do they need? Uh, and, and not so much even financially. It's more like, you know, did they have a bad day? Is she doing good in school? Did she need help with her homework? You know, I guess just as being a mom, I, that's my focus every day is just <laughs> being a mom for them, which I couldn't do <laughs> for so long. Thanks, Cindy. Man, did that answer your question or was there something that you would like, like more specific. specific advice on? And then Christy had a comment. I get the impression prisons are big business and rehabilitation programs would cut into profits among other things. Don't mean to sound simplistic and jaded. It doesn't sound simplistic and jaded, Christy. I agree with you. And especially as more prisons are being turned into for profit. They are big business now. And it, it isn't about rehabilitating people. It really is more about profit. Uh, Christina, do you share with them the realities of what you went through, the law, and how to avoid the traps women can land in? They absolutely know um, what I went through. They, I told them, you know, I was never mom was never away at college. Mom was never on vacation. You know, they knew from the very beginning that mom was in a federal prison because mom made a bad choice. So I, well, that was from the beginning from Adam at age four knew that and understood that. And as they grew older, I would explain things to them in their time of understanding, you know, they didn't know what drugs and all those things were at, you know, five, six, and seven, but they knew about choices and consequences. And that's how I would approach things. You know, now, absolutely. They know everything. They know how I got there. They know, you know, what, why I was there. Um, and they understand that, you know, something is little, and it's kind of funny because they talk about mom, you know, 
you went to jail for marijuana and now it's completely legal. How do you, you know, how does that happen? And I'm like, well, it's not legal federally. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't let them, you know, I, I'm very, very aware of what's going on. And I try and make sure that they're aware of exactly, you know, the choices that they make. And we talk about just even now get they're getting in the cars with friends and and you know they're at those ages autumn's 18 now you know ava just turned 16 and you know i talked to them about you know just even going to the store somebody could have something or go in and steal something and then you're responsible so i have these conversations they're ongoing conversations it's not like you're going to have one conversation it's going to like you know these are kids you got to kind of constantly be feeding them you know life experiences and just giving them examples of what if one thing I did do um, is I did take them to our local jail um, about two years ago and we did a walkthrough and they were able to see firsthand the inside of, of the cell and, and they had a lot of questions because of that and I was able to share even though it was local um, we did like a tour and I just giving them really bones bare bones perspective of what actually you know mom went through. they visited me but they were never like inside um, cause I just want to give them all the tools. I want them to know, you know, and I teach them we're people of color, you know, we're Brown. So I've talked to them about when we get pulled over, what to do with your hands and, and do things like that. You know, I, I, I don't take anything for granted. I try and give them as much information as I can. So it's just constant ongoing conversations of life experiences and my perspective. Do they always listen? No. Do they always want to hear it? No, but I think, you know, they hear it, whether they want to or not, it sticks there little bits at a time. <laughs> a more great advice, they just be really open and honest instead of trying to hide or gloss over things because it, it, they, they, it gives them a little more perspective of what you did go through. So yeah. we have an, another question. Have we been able to broach what resources would have been helpful for you at your release, maybe thinking about what Dismiss House does or what other programs do, thinking about what you needed upon your release? Um, absolutely. Like, I guess like if I hadn't had my family, would it just would have been helpful. We're just having those resources to for jobs, computer, um, being able to learn how to work a computer because <clears throat> excuse me when I came out you know I, I was always computer savvy I was actually building programs before I went in I was always really tech savvy even back then um could build websites even before it was had the auto builders <laughs> but it was all different when I came out you know it took me a while to master that cell phone too so those types of things just learning the basics about maneuvering through you know uh how to get a job and, and where to go, where to start, you know, just, just having those things, even um, how to do your driver's license and, and the things that you just need to move towards becoming independent, like whether it's places that already have lists, of, lists for people who have, um, who hire those who have been incarcerated, you know, who have felonies, those, a lot of places don't, but it'd be helpful to be geared towards people who, you know, are open to that. Um, those kind of shortcuts will help waste a lot of time. I think it, just having those things already in play, like, you know, these people hire, or you know, like this, this is what you need to do these steps. Um, opening up bank accounts. I mean, I'm familiar with all that stuff, but a lot of people aren't. A lot of people weren't raised that way. So just having those basic tools of life skills that they do not give you while you're incarcerated, by the way, none of that stuff is taught to you. Uh, there's no rehabilitation when you're incarcerated. It's all what you choose to do. So there's never requirements. Um, classes and anything that you take is all up to you. You can just sit there the whole time and not do anything. Um, and a lot of people do. I took every class there possibly was just because I had to keep this thing going. <laughs> my brain. Right. Uh, so Sadie does share, in my opinion, all people need to see inside of prison. If people could see the level of cruelty we subject others to for making mistakes, which is something every human does, maybe restorative justice would be taken more seriously and become the norm. Great comment. Thank you, Sadie. I agree. That's part of the reason that I took my daughters because like I, that, you know, to me, I, I wanted them to see firsthand exactly what it is you know when you make a choice something as simple as getting in the wrong car or you know hanging out with the wrong friend 
it, this is where it could lead you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Maria would like to know, did you have any rehab support while incarcerated? Uh, no, I, I never used drugs. Um, I'm not, I just never, I smoked a little marijuana like early on when I was in my twenties, but no, I didn't ever use drugs. I've never did like any of those things. I just happened to date a guy who did sell drugs, unfortunately. So what other questions do we have for Cindy? Feel free to raise your hand, put it in the chat box, or you can unmute and ask your question. I'm an open book, <laughs> trust me. No one else has a question. I have another one. I have a lot of them. <laughs> okay, go for it. So Cindy, one of the things that really struck me is that you mentioned that you're from a marginalized group. So I'm really interested if you feel that your sentencing, your charging would have been different. Your sentencing, not so much maybe because there was a mandatory minimum. Do you feel that if you were Caucasian, and color, you may not have been charged with such an egregious crime. I can't, I can't say that. I don't, I don't know. Um, pro probably not. I'm guessing because I, I've seen a lot of the news. I've seen people in that same situation who were just given um, not any time. So I would assume, I mean, I, I would like to think no. Um, but the reality is that most likely I would have been given a lighter sentence or not charged mm -hmm. as, mm -hmm. you know, charged as much, I would assume, but I can't say for sure. Statistics show that generally people in marginalized groups do tend to get the heavier sentences. Yeah. I just don't, I hate to think the world like that, even though we live in it, I still like to look in the bright side, I guess, even after everything. <laughs> Love this question from Maria. This is really valuable. What or who needs to be available for an abused woman to seek help while involved with the abuser? What or who? I mean, I try and think about what could have for myself. I'm thinking what would have gotten me to leave? What would have helped me feel safe to leave? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really sure what have helped me feel safe <clears throat> to leave. I can't, I can't answer that because I don't know what would have really, I mean, I guess my, I don't want to say my experience was like um, more than somebody else's because I can't say that. I just know like the person that I was dealing with, it was, he walked around with guns all the time. Um, I slept on a pillow with his hand underneath my pillow with a gun. So I slept with my head on a pillow underneath was a gun. That's how I slept. I was at a constant fight or flight. So like, it's hard to say, you know, in another situation, I think my situation was a little bit different. I don't like to think that other people were in, in such a high violent situation where it was a, it was a really, uh, it's hard to explain it, but it was like, it was a constant, it was never, you could never just like relax. There was never that. It was always really heightened. So I never even had a moment to like, think and I think that was part of the abuse like I never even could think mm -hmm. um when you're kept in that situation so it's hard to say um because I didn't even have access to people and and I couldn't go anywhere I guess you know maybe like a very large pit campaign you know something where you knew like you could go to this place and be safe I, I'm really not sure how to answer that unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Cindy. Um, Sadie recommends a, a local domestic violence agency. And then we also do have WISE as well. For those of you that aren't familiar with WISE, thank you, Megan. It's a really wonderful and supportive place for abusive situations. So we do have a couple of comments too that I want to be certain we share with you, Cindy. So 
Thank you so much for sharing today, Cindy. You are remarkable. Thank you for telling your story. It certainly helps advocating for change. We have learned from hearing your story. We wish you and your family the best going forward. That's from Paul and Wendy. And Karen, I so appreciate the session and Cindy openly sharing herself and her story. So really, really appreciate you being here today, Cindy. And thank you for everything. And um, so it's 101, we do understand if some of you need to scoot. It looks like we have one final question. So Christina, I see your hand is up. Yeah, thank you. I, I was just um, reviewing in my head the, the gap that you mentioned between when the uh, boyfriend that you were with was murdered and it was of six years I think before you before they came to get you um, and I wonder if there was anything that could be done in that amount of time because there was some prior prior involvement with the courts and you didn't know that federal would eventually come to get you Is there, uh, yeah just wondering if there's some if that's the area of time that um, we could have gotten more help and I don't know if that would have prevented the outcome. I mean, it's possible, but as far I didn't know that the federal government was going to open up, you know, pick up the case because they initially they had picked it up and dropped it and the state picked it up and dropped it and then the feds picked it back up and dropped it. So that's where it had set. Um, I was unaware that, you know, they were going to come back um, six years later. I think they, they knew it. <laughs> I think they knew. They just didn't let anybody else know. Um, and even after that, when, when my case was initially dismissed, you know, I, I did pick the pieces of my life back up. I did personally do counseling and, you know, I ended up, like you said, meeting someone and getting married and having a family and I was piecing my life back together. Um, but they just came under the seven year, there's a seven year, you know, mark where they can't arrest me after the indictment. So I think they just came right before the seven year mark. I'm not sure what else I could have done. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. It's hard to talk about things, but at the same time, it is therapeutic. <laughs> so I thank you for that. And I just appreciate everything that you guys are doing and the work that you continue to do and just caring and being here and, and being open to this. And and wanting to make change. I think that's really important for those who are still incarcerated and those that are you know, coming home. So thank you. Cindy, thank you so much. I'm going to post the link to the documentary, The Sentence, into the chat box for anyone that's interested in learning more or watching the movie. And thank you again so much, Cindy, for sharing your story with us. We, we really thank you. you. And thank you. You are incredible, brave, and inspiring. Thank you everyone for coming today. Enjoy your weekend and we hope to see you next event. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You guys have a good day. You too. Yep. Bye.